Welcome back. Yes, indeed. We're talking about the oil and gas industry. That sector, yeah, it does affect a lot of things in this country. As you can see, Mr. Lou Adelshun joins us. He is the chairman of MoMAN, that's Major Oil Marketers Association of Nigeria. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on the program today. Good morning, Chamberlain. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so uh, in this sector, there's quite a few things that will just need explanation, your explanation being in that industry and a player there. Uh, so let's start off with this one. I mean, if people hear 7,000 jobs, of course, who doesn't want more jobs created? But and it, it's also coming as probably part of uh, policies by this administration in that sector to see how they could get things going. But we know uh, fuel subsidy, its attendance effects on one hand and this on the other. So tell us, your, give us your impression about this particular one now, because, I mean, when they tell us it's a first time of getting an indigenous company also been involved here, what are the implications of this, I mean, to the average person now in terms of the benefits? Thank you very much. Um, so, I mean, first of all, it has to be commended that an indigenous company has, uh, has managed to sign uh, an agreement, or at least an MOU, that suggests that a floating LNG storage facility will be built in Nigeria. Uh, the closest example we have of something similar in the region is the Kribi floating LNG terminal in Cameroon. It is uh, about 1.2 million uh, tons per annum, and I think it was done at a cost of about $1.2 billion. So hearing that there's a $5 billion investment is, uh, is, quite, is quite interesting. Um, from uh, from, uh, from uh, a localized point of view, I agree with the employment uh, discussion. It will certainly create employment because we need Nigerians to to run uh, the, the the project. And you also need Nigerians to operate it as a as a going concern. The there are still some details that we need to hear. I mean, first of all, uh, what we've heard so far is just the headline. Uh, we all know that there are some underlying issues with uh, gas gathering and regasification centers in Nigeria. So first of all, that infrastructure will need to be developed in parallel. Mm. Secondly, I think that it's obvious that Nigeria also today does not consume that much LNG. Um, it is not a, a, a gas that has historically been used in Nigeria. Uh, the Egwene terminal, for instance, I think received about 1.2, one and a half cargoes over the past uh, year on a per annum basis. So what this suggests is that there is an export opportunity here. Unless, of course, some of these considerations, which include uh, security as well, are dealt with. So it suggests that the, the, the focus here might be for export. But it's really hard to, uh, to make a valid and considered judgment off the back of a, of a headline. But it's really commendable that the investment opportunities are starting to roll in. And we're starting to see real projects that, are, that have uh, global impact created here in Nigeria. Right. So well, what are those other items that you, you say or you expect them to explain a little further so people can have deeper understanding of the implications of this particular policy? Sure, uh, Chamberlain. So, I mean, one of the things that, uh, that, that plagues the industry is really around gas gathering. Um, there are lots of, we know we have an abundance of gas as a country, yeah. but we need to aggregate that gas in such a way that it can flow steadily and consistently into the, uh, into the, uh, into the compression or the cooling uh, terminals for the LNG to actually be created. We need to create that infrastructure. It doesn't exist today. So there needs to be a considered and deliberate framework for pulling these things across. The other issue is one that is very well known, and it's security. And it's, I mean, and it's something that we'll probably talk about over the course of today. It's security. You have a, you have a floating LNG station that's slightly offshore. You will need to make sure that security is addressed at a national level. Again, we're very good. Uh, we're very positive about the news of the appointment of the new uh, security uh, uh, boss. And we hope that there'll be a lot more done in that space because it really impacts not just LNG, but it also impacts our crude oil production as well. Um, then there is uh, the matter of uh, the demand. As I said, it's a, it's a problem. Um, or it's a problem or an opportunity. Uh, we need to find industries such as the power sectors that really use LNG. But to get that, to make that happen, we need to create the framework for transportation across the country. So you need uh, pipelines that can take LNG. Now, I hear a 2026 uh, uh, 
date, even if we had another factor, you know, we had another factor of two more years, by 2027, if there is a deliberate and focused way of dealing with this, of addressing some of these issues in a constructive way, then it's possible that this will, that this will be, we can develop these other uh, infrastructures and really create an opportunity for domestic use of LNG, as in other countries, as well as uh, earn the FX that will come from the export of the product itself, as well as the job creations that have been job creation. Mm. Uh, from a marketer's point of view, Steve, if I could bring this home a little. Yeah. From a marketer's point of view, um, LNG is not a gas that we have historically traded in. We're downstream retail business. Uh, what we have typically invested in is LPG, the liquefied petroleum gas, which is typically used as a cooking fuel. Um, we believe that with, uh, with LPG, we're in a position where we can actually use it as auto gas as well. It has been used in other countries. This is in addition to the discussions going on about CNG. So we believe that actually we're able to unify the specification of LPG for cooking and LPG for auto gas. Then we really can leverage that investment mm -hmm. that we have already made to drive down the cost of running transportation in the country. Again, this is in addition to the works and discussions ongoing with CNG. So from a marketer's point of view, we will have to take a right turn and really focus on the gases that we have made investments in. Mm. So help shed a little more light on this for us. I mean, yes, they tell us that um, uh, the processing and, sh and uh, shipping or storage of this does, it reduces the environmental footprint, but this doesn't need transport pipelines to get it to the shore, but you say there are issues of transportation. Could you sh explain that a little further? Well, there are two steps to it, right? Uh, you would need to, this is a floating LNG plant, so there's got to be a framework or a mechanism for bringing the gas to the shore, right? That's the first one. So that pipeline is fairly straightforward. But then to move the LNG from where it is, uh, from, where, from the terminal where it's collected, into the areas where it's going to be used. And this can be nationwide, right? Uh, you have power plants, you have other uh, heavy industry that will use an LNG as a fuel. Let's not forget the whole point of liquefying natural gas is to make it easy to transport. That's really it. Because when it gets to its destination, you will need to regasify it so it becomes a gas. And that's the format in which it is used for productivity. Uh, okay, so... If so you will... Yeah. yeah, go ahead. So you will still need to you will still need to create a, pipe, a network of pipelines that uh, which you use to transport it from the in, from the terminal, uh, the onshore terminal into the various uh, locations, which can be nationwide where it's going to be used and regasified, and also and that infrastructure also needs to be created. And this is not cheap, right? Regasification plants are notoriously expensive, and they're one of the LNG is one of the more expensive undertakings. In the uh, in the uh, in the oil and gas industry. So I, I know so you spoke the... about. Oh, my apologies. I know you spoke about you know uh, local players and bringing it back home a little, which we will much more. So, uh, how are local businesses? Are they do they stand a chance? Are they going to benefit from this in the long or short term, whatsoever? Um, I believe it's a long term. Uh, it'll be a long term benefit. The direct impact is that once this project gets signed and it moves from uh, the appraise to the select to the definition phase, then it will create um, lots of opportunities. It will create capacity. Um, LNG, as we know, is a is a very well priced uh, commodity globally. So there'll be that all of that employment. But for the for Nigerians to really truly benefit from it, at least at a headline level we will need to make sure that we have other co infrastructure components, which will require additional investment beyond the five billion that has been mentioned as part of, uh, for this very specific project. So we'll need to do, we'll need to, we'll need to hear a bit more about the Chamberlain. We'll need to understand it just a little bit more beyond the announcement that we've seen in the news over the last cycle. Okay, Mr. Dilshin, you've listed a couple of benefits that this will have on the nation uh, job creation, um, jobs will be created, the local businesses yes. will get to benefit from it eventually. But when Nigerians, and many of them hear the, the, that word, gas, the first thing that comes to mind is, come on, we're burning gas out there. So let's step back a little bit and break this down. 
Um, this has nothing to do with the glass flaring situation we have in the Niger Delta that we'll continue to talk about and how much money that can be made from that for the economy and uh, the positive impact on the environment, does it? Um, well, it's all tied. So you recall I mentioned gas gathering. There has to be a collective framework for aggregating the gas from the various locations, right? If you don't start exploit, explore, exploring uh, uh, an asset, a, an oil asset or a gas asset, you will not get the gas out. But once it comes out, you have to have a mechanism for collecting it. Thankfully, under the PIA, we have a, under the National Gas Layering Program, we have an initiative which, are, or we have uh, regulatory initiatives which actually enforce the uh, gathering of this gas. But it needs to be done in such a way that all of those various gas sources are aggregated somehow, mm -hmm. gathered, and then channeled through a pipeline to this LNG, to this floating LNG facility, or any other LNG facility for that matter where it gets cooled down at very, very low temperatures into a liquid, and then it can then get pushed back out for commercial and industrial use. While we're talking the, the, the technical and commercial matters here, there's a political will to see the implementation of the execution of this um, these uh, MOU that's being signed. The other side's also the, the benefits as they may be to the Nigerian people vis-a-vis -vis the PIA that has been, and many still wonder how, um, how much of that law is being implemented to the fullest. Would that in any way help in uh, seeing this through? Um, absolutely, I think it would. Uh, so one of the uh, ways to make something happen, so as you say, I completely agree, first of all, about the political will. Uh, this administration has set out straight out of the traps and they are making very bold moves. I couldn't be uh, prouder of the steps and the gains that are, that are being made here. It's very clear that it's an investment-friendly administration. Um, what we need to make sure that we're also cognizant of is the fact that some of these, uh, some of these investments, have, people have to be incentivized to make them. And what the uh, PIA does, and what the regulator, the authority, has also done, is that they have deployed both carrot and stick. Right? There, the stick in the sense of there are very clear guidelines on sanctions for gas flaring, for instance, or for uh, misbehavior uh, in the industry. So it's the it's a combination of that guy, the uh, the carrot and the stick that's really going to drive the right behaviors, first of all, so that we are able to really amass the gas in the quantities it's needed. I mean, it's uh, the the ratio of gas to liquid is about 600 to 1. So for every, you need to, you need to gather 600 times the volume of gas to create like one, one unit of liquid. So it's quite a lot of gas that's required, and it would require everything, uh, investments, uh, sanctions, incentivization, all of that colluding together to create the right environment for productivity. You see, that matter, that matter of sanctions brings to mind, again, the, the effectiveness of our regulations. The regulatory agencies that the PIA has um, put forward, one wonders how, how much of that has even take, uh, well, has begun to work, because in, the, in layman's terms, the, the darkness around or the murkiness around the petroleum industry in Nigeria is deep and really dark. And more light needs to be shed there before even this kind of investment, as good and lovely as they may sound, can even begin to take root as they should. What can be done immediately, so to speak, to see a little bit of more light in that area? Uh, Chamberlain, I have to. I, first of all, I have to agree with you uh, about the reputation of uh, of the industry, right? Uh, whether deserved or not is, uh, is debatable, but I have to agree with you because there has been a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, secrecy and lack of transparency around it. Um, but I can tell you that from what I've seen over the last uh, six months, in terms of the authorities' uh, desire and push for regulations, for clarity around the policy statements that are in the PIA, uh, some of the early sanctions that I'm beginning to see, and the fact that the PIA, for the first time since it was uh, gazetted in 2021, is now front and center, and it is the de facto playbook, if you like, 
for the industry. This has not been the case before. So we have to give it a chance. And if you go and look at the most recent publications uh, by, the, uh, by the authority, for instance, who is uh, my industry regulator, you will see that there is a lot of positivity in terms of, uh, in terms of what's being done. And I can assure you uh, that companies are now being sanctioned. And as we move into this new world, the only way we're going to be, and I, the new world is the PIA world, the only way that we're going to be able to hold players to account, and I know the authority is absolutely focused on this, the only way we're going to hold uh, players to account is first of all to be very clear about the rules of the of the rules of the road. I can assure you that there will probably be a lot more revenue coming in, and I don't mean that in a in a cynical way at all, from sanctions and fines than there are for letting people uh, letting people get off. And we 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 have to we have to we have no choice. But we have to believe that the PIA, given the prominence it has today, and given the visibility it has today. Is going to is going to work. Hmm. Well, uh, Mr. Deoshu, uh, for the neophytes who have no idea what you're talking about, what you mentioned, floating liquefied natural gas plants. Um, the, the, when they hear LNG, for instance, their mind first of all goes to Nigeria LNG. So to hear that, okay, this is the first time we are hearing of we're having uh, a project of this magnitude in Africa. It's a floating LNG plant or project, uh, but then Nigeria has an indigenous uh, LNG organization called Nigeria LNG. What's the difference between the two? Um, right. So what's the difference between L between NLNG? Uh, NLNG, I believe, is a, is a company that's owned by a consortium of uh, of IOCs, which in including uh, NNPC. The I guess the celebration on this, and really I'm a downstream person, but the celebration on this particular. Uh, act is that of this particular uh, MOU is that it is something that's actually owned by and driven and sponsored by an indigenous player, right? So that's that that, that for me would be the fundamental with the fundamental difference well, perhaps, is that you have an indigenous player here. Yeah, perhaps another uh, significance uh, or outstanding feature is that it's floating. What does that mean? Uh, that means that it's uh, that means that it's offshore. Okay. Right. That means that it's uh, not uh, it's uh, it's somewhere, and we don't know what the distance out uh, at sea it is. But it's uh, it's it's uh, it's floating. It's not connected to the shore. Okay. Which means that a pipeline would need to be created to connect it uh, to shore. Wait, it's wait. not the first in Africa. Like I said, in okay. Cameroon, Kribi, they have built uh, an FLNG there as well, okay. which has been operating successfully. Which then raises the question whether or not we may or not have uh, issues around host communities and all um, rise in this particular matter? Is there any risk to any community near or far? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure before the MOE was discussed and as part of their project feasibility studies, the promoters would have, uh, would have taken that into consideration. I mean, one of the things I mentioned earlier was security would also be a would be, a, would be a, a key consideration in the success of, uh, of the project. And that is not something that any one company can do in particular, but it would be something that the government, in collaboration with the private sector, would need to address on a holistic basis because it impacts not only this FLNG uh, project, but it actually impacts our productivity as a country. Um, the government has promised uh, 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 four billion, uh, sorry, 4 million barrels a day on the horizon. We're currently at one point something. Uh, because we're losing a lot of uh, our productivity, our production to uh, to theft, vandalism, etc., uh, etc. Et so security is a key consideration for any uh, undertaking in the hydrocarbon space, particularly if they're operating along the coastline and in the Niger Delta area. So it needs to be addressed fundamentally. Otherwise, uh, it will just be money down the drain. To be honest. Well, Mr. Adesho, another uh, issue of interest to me is the fact that the NNPCL has uh, seems to be very interested in gas in recent time. Well, of course, uh, Nigeria LNG is more than 10 years old. Uh, this conversation around a floating liquefied natural gas project uh, started in Nigeria more than a year ago. Uh, the conversation has been on for a while. Uh, but then there is also the Nigeria-Morocco gas uh, pipeline project. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, the involvement of the NNPCL in all of these, do you think uh, the company is 
do you agree or believe that the company is not uh, biting too much at a particular time? Is it able to accommodate all of these in the, in the interest of um, maximizing and exploring and exploiting all of the opportunities that Nigeria has in the gas space? Um, that's an interesting question. So I'm I'm uh, I'm an outsider to NNPCL. I represent a, a private uh, uh, a company. I also represent the Major Oil Marketers Association of Nigeria. We are very much interested in the in the downstream space. Um, I I'm sure that any project that uh, that will be undertaken by NNPC will go through all of the rigors of. Uh, of, uh, of, of a project planning of that scale, i.e., it'll go through an appraisal process, it'll go through a selection process, it'll go through a define in terms of what it hopes to achieve, it'll go into execution and hopefully operate. Um, I am not sure I'm in a position to uh, discuss on, to, to, to opine on whether or not it's capable of doing it. No, no, I, I'm uh, aware of that, uh, Mr. Adiyashi. I just wanted to be, I mean, you're a Nigerian as well. Okay, so oh, okay. it's from, from that perspective. Nigeria. Yes, it's from oh. that perspective that I'm looking at it, particularly because now, I mean, look, look at the Nigeria Morocco uh, gas pipeline, for instance, has uh, involves about 14 African countries uh, in, oh. in the in the entire space, and that's quite a lot. So one, okay, one so is just that's just the the perspective. Okay, so I can oh, I can help you out with that. So that's very simple. Look, um, the PIA makes a provision for NNPC to be broken up into. Uh, it's a uh, discrete unit, so companies specializing in various aspects. Once you have that done, then this issue of focus goes out the window because you will then have a company that's focused exclusively on gas, and that is its, its, uh, its mission. You have another company that's focused on pipeline. You have another company that will focus on something else. And all of this will be done not by NNPC alone or NNPCL alone, but in collaboration with other players, other investors, other sponsors. So I think then that burden and the risk sharing becomes more apparent and it will be less of an issue as we've, uh, uh, in terms of uh, focus and ability to execute because of multiple competing projects. Well, Mr. Adiosho, still situating this investment within the context of um, the Petroleum Industry Act, uh, what areas should we begin to look at in that act in terms of protecting the host communities? You know, in the past, we've heard... Um, you know, indigents of communities protesting about siting, um, you know, headquarters of major oil companies outside their location and also protesting, you know, um, the outsourcing of jobs that should come to their own people. So what areas of the PIA should we begin to look at uh, w within the context of the concern that we must protect our own, you know, within those areas where those uh, natural resource will be located? Okay, so I can't cite the specific uh, uh, section within the Act, but there are provisions made for host communities uh, within the Act. Uh, there is a host community uh, fund uh, that, uh, that is set up, which is basically made up of members of the community, and the purpose of that funding is to do two things. It's one, to make sure that the interests of the host communities are protected, but it's also to, pro it's also to incentivize uh, those communities in terms of their ability, in terms of them being able to protect the assets that are placed along their literal, uh, in the literal communities, such that there is very little, uh, so that in the event of vandalism or anything like that, the host communities are the first point of contact and also the first point of accountability. I believe there are also provisions in that same uh, in that same uh, in that same act for employment. Now I can't comment on uh, whether or not the the headquarters of uh, of companies would be situated in in the uh, in the host community areas, but it's uh, I think it's incumbent on the communities as well to create uh, environments that are conducive to all of these. Uh, Things that make a business that make a business interesting and make a business want to situate in those communities. Mm, interesting. Uh, earlier, I also noted that you you uh, pointed out the low consumption rate of um, you know um, LNG within the country. Uh, but is it to say that um, you know Nigeria cannot? Um, you know, begin to transit, particularly because of the, um, you know, low uh, environmental footprint potential of LNG. And of, of course, there's also the um, 
industry requirements as well. So, and then I'd like you to also, uh, if you can, tell us about the current potential of the production capacity of Nigeria for CNG, which is a huge uh, you know, conversation now, particularly because of the removal of subsidy. So what are the prospects in these areas? Okay, so um, on, the, on the LNG side, I think I've said uh, uh, quite a few things there, specifically that there's, there's low adoption. So a lot more work would need to be done in terms of putting the framework, the actual infrastructure required to move LNG from one location to the other. Now, uh, the major marketers and the downstream community have made investments specifically in two areas. In CNG, you have some, you have that uh, which is compressed natural gas, uh, which also has a very clean uh, uh, output. The main uh, outputs are carbon dioxide uh, and, uh, and water. So there is, uh, there, there's, there's opportunity there. Now, many of us have invested in, L in LPG, which is actually a gas that's, that's good for both cooking and transportation as auto gas. Uh, the, the reasoning behind uh, CNG and using gas as a, as, a, as a transport fuel is very obvious. Nigeria has an abundance of gas. There's still a challenge around aggregating all that gas and getting it to where it needs to. If you speak to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to countries that have an abundance of gas, as well as pipelines, they're not necessarily using L, they're not necessarily using CNG. Now, there's an interesting point that people may not know. CNG, uh, sorry, LPG as a fuel has more energy content per liter, almost three times, than gasoline, right? A lot of investment has already been made in the downstream in LPG. So we already have a ready infrastructure for LPG as auto gas. There is a bit of work that needs to be done around the use of CNG, and I believe that there is some funding available for that, but it's still a lot of gas, it's still a lot of work to be done, and I do not believe that it's necessarily a, a near-term solution. Oh. But right? I don't believe it's a near-term solution, and but there's some other considerations that need to be made. Okay. It's more of a mid-term solution to really get it to, to get its adoption to the levels that we will need okay. to really make it a viable alternative to PMS. But okay, now, now you're going to the space that I wanted to ask you the question now, which is uh, how significantly for those who are still wary of uh, this whole conversation around CNG, how significantly will it impact the price of petrol or the costs they will expend on energy? Uh, in their homes. There are those who are already you know, calculating that 12.5 uh, kilogram of gas uh, converted uh, for generator will only give them about uh, one day, maybe a little over a day of uh, use of the generator. Uh, how, how significantly will it, will it crash the cost of energy that people use for gas, for their cars and all of that? I mean, I think the, the first thing to say is that let's, let's deal with the reality of the fuel subsidy. Um, Nigerians are going through a lot of hardship, and that's, that's the reality. And so when you hear people uh, looking at uh, all of these various mechanisms, all these various means as alternative fuels, it's really looking, that's really local innovation and trying to deal with the problem that is causing them a lot of sleepless nights. Um, in isolation, it would, have, it would appear as though what we have is a, is a very simple transportation problem, but it's not. There are, there are so many competing policies today that are really making it difficult. So whether or not a, a, a canister of CNG or LPG takes you, uh, takes you one night, it's, it's really the symptom. And what we need to do as a country is really rally together, both governments, uh, states, uh, states and, uh, and federal, is really to rally to a point where we are all contributing somehow to take the pain away in small, small doses, right? What do I mean by that? Today, we have a situation where um, fuel subsidy has been removed, so the cost of transportation has gone up. Uh, the cost of people getting to work every day has shot up significantly. Uh, to get a bus from uh, Laos to, uh, to VIT, there's about 700 naira. That was not the case uh, uh, two, three months ago. So it's, it's gone up. 
In addition to that, you have other competing uh, fuels. Diesel, for instance, we have a 7.5% VAT increase on fuels. It's all, whilst these things may not be done to, uh, to make life difficult for Nigerians, to a casual observer, it would seem as though there is an assault on their way of life and making uh, 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 and, and how they live and the cost of living. So when you see people trying to solve for uh, something, it's because there is not a ready viable alternative. What we must do, and really what we must do, is to make sure that things that relate to food, fuel, and transportation are really given priority today. And this is quite aside from uh, from from health. Uh, food, transportation, and fuel really need to be given a uh, very specific focus. And there, is, there are a few things that can be done uh, in that space, right? I mean, look, we are, we are, we are in very difficult times. Nigerians are, are by nature innovative people, but we really, need to, we, we really need to take steps. I mean, food, people need to start looking at how, uh, how we can help, even at a, subsist, at a local subsist, subsistence basis. Right for gas, we need to make sure that the solution that we choose, the solution that we choose is the right one. We need to make sure that we are not just uh, we're not creating another problem. So with CNG, uh, let's talk about that for two seconds. You need a canister of uh, a CNG, uh, several canisters of CNG to go into the back of a of a car. You lose you lose boot space. What we really should be looking at is a combination of every, of all of the energy sources. LNG is so LNG, uh, sorry, LPG is one. CNG is one. PMS is still a viable and realistic alternative. And what we're seeing in industry today is that players are going to great lengths to try to see what they can do to, br to bring down the cost of this product, right? To bring down the cost of this product. We're also seeing people invest in alternative, uh, in, uh, in, in solar, for instance. That is a very clear, ready alternative to diesel as, a, as an energy or power fuel. So, we're, so there, there, we, we kind of need to diversify the focus and thinking in terms of what the solution is. The solution is not one thing, it's not two things. It's really being able to address all of the various uh, pieces that go into the energy mix. And we have an abundance of, uh, of, uh, of, of sunlight. So I, I, I think there is room for, for electric vehicles. We have seen some states already take a bold step in mass transit EVs. That is viable. Is as viable as the conversion kits that we're talking about for CNG. It is. It is. It is sustainable. LPG is sustainable. Let's see. All right, we're here. Let's see if we can explore that a little bit as we talk about fuel subsidy. Now we know that two days after the president spoke about fuel subsidy removal, the group. CEO of NMPCL did say that the federal government owed it six billion six billion dollars six billion dollars which is 2.8 trillion naira and they said that was the exact amount that they had used in paying for to keep the fuel cheap now two days ago we also did see comments coming through from NMPCL that uh, since January 2016 no subsidy had been paid to any marketer. And that kind of confuses quite a lot of people who are looking from a distance. I mean, since you were in there, I imagine you, you might have come across that narrative. Could you explain to us what that meant? Because people thought that they've been paying subsidy all this while. What does that mean, really? I mean, uh, I'm not an economist, but I think uh, we followed the, uh, the, the, the logic the, the subsidy comes at a cost. Somebody has to bear that cost. We have been buying and consuming petrol uh, that we have not, we as citizens have not necessarily, necessarily paid for fully because we had a, a subsidy policy. Um, NNPC has been the sole importer of petrol uh, for some time now. Um, that, it follows therefore that they have carried the can in terms of the actual uh, the actual payment of the difference of, uh, uh, of, the, of the difference between the actual cost of petrol and the cost at which it was being sold to uh, to Nigerians 
So there's, so there's something in that. And let's not forget, at the end of the day, we're not even talking, it's, it's a savings we're talking about, right? It's not really real money. It's not these savings, unless it's directed purposefully and properly, it's not going to necessarily save Nigerians' hardship today. It's not. And this gives us, I mean, this gives me a lot of concern in terms of how we're dealing with what everyday Nigerians are going through. So, yes, uh, uh, I mean, as a, as, a, as, as, a, as a company, we, uh, many of my, mel as a, sorry, as a professional association, many of my, uh, many of my uh, uh, members have not necessarily uh, fully reconciled on some of the payback that has come with our contribution to the subsidies in terms of transportation, for instance. So we have not been fully reconciled there. I know that there are discussions ongoing with the authority to make sure that that reconciliation happens. And I think at a national level, there is still a reconciliation that needs to happen. So I was a bit surprised to hear you say that there was a precise number of six point something billion that had been called out because as far as I'm aware, no, the full reconciliation has not happened and therefore nobody has a precision on the numbers. And what we've really got to deal with is how are we going to support, how are we as Nigerians going to get through this hardship in the near term? Because I believe in the long term, the prospects are there. The pain we're going through now, the bigger, the fuel subsidy removal, the FX unification, and hopefully we'll get crude productivity up, we'll get security dealt with, and we'll have dealt with all of the big fundamental okay. issues that are... Uh, that pardon me, Mr. Joshua. So when you yeah. say you're a bit surprised about those numbers, because... Uh, I could just quote it directly uh, about the NMPC hell in terms of how no. much they say federal government was owing them because that amount oh, no, was, is what they yeah, say no. they've spent to keep it cheap. So are you saying that that amount we, we can't go with that amount as of yet? Oh, I'm saying you no. Know, you said I think there was a precision about the number that I questioned. Yeah, the right? two point eight trillion because, dollars, six billion dollars. <laughs> so those no, I mean, as far as I'm aware, that so this will be a ballpark figure. As far as I'm aware, there is still a reconciliation that needs to happen to so arrive at the pre... I was just talking to the oh. precision. There's no doubt that money is owed. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's all government. It's crude, which was uh, which is Nigeria's uh, equity barrels that was used as part of the, the, the transaction. So there is a lot more going on in there that needs to be reconciled to arrive at what a precise number should be so is it going to be i mean your estimation if you could just off the cuff is it like <laughs> higher or will it be a lot less than this oh i um i really can't uh, i really can't uh, I, I i don't have enough of a broad view across the the crude the products that have been brought in the uh, uh the payments that have not been made to uh to fact i'm just like in terms of visibility in that in that regard my concern really is around how we as an industry body can deal and support Nigerians as they go through this, this crisis of, uh, of uh, or this economic crisis that's really impacting their day-to-day -day lives. And speaking and about supporting the, us, business. Yeah, yes. I, I, as we wind down on this one, many Nigerians feel that marketers or that sector takes them for a ride because of the way this just goes back and forth. Probably if you say they don't understand it, maybe you could shed a little more light on because we hear the government say, look, this product that is supposed to be subsidized, it's not getting to the actual people. It's not achieving the aim for which it was set out. That, number one, we're subsidizing neighboring countries. And people wonder, how can that ever be possible? Then they tell us, we don't know how much exactly we're consuming. And yet, you know how much leaves... Uh, the depot, how much is landing cost, they can exactly fathom. How do we arrive at this exact price that NAPC says, this is the band within which petrol has got to be sold. So, so many things that we don't understand here about what to go home with. And then, to make it worse, as though adding insult upon injury, we hear rumors, maybe you could tell us, that petrol could sell for, what, 700 naira per liter. You heard about that, didn't you? Oh, I've read. Um, I've read all sorts in the uh, in the in the in the in the in the papers. I picked it up in the airwaves. So, um, can I just take a stab at trying to set uh, some um, some reality around some of the things that have been said? Um, I think um, look, let's, there's no denying it. Uh, the, the it's a fact that products Nigeria's subsidized product has made its way across our borders. 
as a fact. And uh, hopefully that is a historic fact that will still need to be uh, looked at. Uh, the reality is that our numbers, our consumption numbers have been higher than they ought to have been. Right. Uh, and as a consequence, we have seen some uh, we have seen some issues uh, at petrol stations, particularly with uh, product availability, because we had a single importer and also issues with uh, with supply, because uh, there was a lot. There's a lot of demand that was not being met. Uh, the situation we are at today is different. Right. Uh, NMPCL, as the uh, custodian of the strategic stocks, has enough petrol to last us 30 days. That is our national backstop, our national reserves, to put it in, in one way. Um, what we're going to see marketers do is marketers doing what the private sector does best, which is that they're going to compete. And in, the, in that competition, Nigerians will benefit. There are certain elements to, that make up the cost of uh, a liter of oil at the pump. Some of it is fixed, and some of it is variable and completely out of Nigeria's control. The ones that are fixed are things like uh, taxis, uh, levies, maybe some, uh, some uh, jetty costs that are, that, are, that are prorated per volume. Those are fixed. But there are some variables which matter, which add significantly to the cost of oil or petrol delivered at, at pump. Uh, for instance, the floating uh, price, that is the, world, the index price, is not uh, within our control. That is driven by the bigger uh, macro laws of uh, uh, demand and supply. There are freight charges. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just sticking on that petrol, uh, on that price point for a second. Okay. The abnormal issue in, uh, in, in Russia and Ukraine today means that those, the price of crude is artificially high, and therefore its derivatives are also high. By derivatives, I mean uh, PMS, uh, diesel, jet fuel, all those other byproducts. Okay. Then you have uh, then you have uh, vessels. The cost of vessels is high, and what you're going to see the private sector do today, just to bring it home, is that we're going to try to optimize. FX is a big issue as well. So FX yesterday, as I guess it was at seven eighty to the dollar. That's a price at which we will do. So what marketers are the good marketers are doing, or marketers are doing, is that we're going to try to go for turnover, import, sell. Convert the price. Uh, All right, Mr. The Doshi, pardon me to jump in because we, we need to go, yeah. but let me just add this bit. Um, if you could keep it as short as possible, we'll appreciate it. Number one is that um, uh, we understand that uh, no new product has come into the country. So people wonder why are we paying for this product when we're still paying for the old stock? It's still old stock that's available. So, on what basis yes. are we paying this new price? And secondly, we never heard anything say, I mean, the byproduct of the crude that we export. Do we bring that back in this country? Nobody talks about that. Yeah, uh, two very good points, and I'll be brief as you have uh, guided. The first one is that there is a replacement cost uh, principle. So as I said to you before, as marketers, our job is to sell oil at the best price to people, is to turn over. We're volume, we're volume businesses rather than... Uh, so my company, for instance, is a volume business. We're a volume business rather than... Uh, rather than a focus on margin. We know it's up and down. Sometimes, some days you win, some days you lose. But you have to take that, when you sold, you have to convert that money into, a, into something that you used to buy the next uh, cargo. Otherwise, that cycle will break. Uh, a few of us are already in the importation business. We are really going to test the waters. We're going to take the risk to see if we can bring in products and land it cheaper than what we are currently seeing in the markets today. Now, the reality is that the variables mean that the price can go up and the price can go down. But in a free market economy, which I believe is where we are today, what you are more likely to see is a race to the bottom because people will try to outprice each other and the consumer okay. gains. The consumer gains. What about to the, the byproduct before we go? So the other point about the byproducts, yeah. it's absolutely criminal what has happened. If you take a barrel of oil today, and let's say $71, uh, $71 per barrel. If you were to fully extract and exploit the value locally, that value, that, that same uh, $71 barrel of oil will give you $2,000 in terms of value. So what we must do to address this is we must get those local refineries on stream. I know there's a lot of work going on in the background and we're praying and hoping that those refineries come on so that we have yet another source 
uh, of, of uh, fuels and its byproducts. Okay. We're also expecting the Dangote refinery to come on stream. We have no line of sight to when it's going to be ready, but we pray again for the sake of Nigerians that it comes on stream very soon. All right, uh, we have to anchor at that point, Mr. Olu Adioshun, Chairman of Momen. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right, so let's uh, move on to the very next one. In fact, we'll continue on that same breath. There's just so many things to exhaust, and so those and more. So we'll, we'll be back in just a moment and take on our very next guests. Stay on with us.